Take your Bible, turn to the book of Galatians, if you would. You know, while I'm, while I'm thinking about that, in Galatians, uh, turn to Galatians chapter 4, and I'll show you something. And somebody the other day, when I mentioned, I made a post on Facebook about uh, my wife having to have surgery this week. And some Jezebel uh, wrote a very hateful comment. Um, how dare I follow some kind of satanic government guidelines and have them butcher my wife when there are uh, herbal remedies or something like that. Well, I went to that woman's Facebook page. Do you know what she means by herbal? Yeah. Yeah, she's a pot smoker. Yeah. So anyway, marvel not, Jesus said, when men revile you and persecute you for righteousness sake. Marvel not. Uh, in Galatians 4, let me show you who's persecuting you. Verse, in Galatians 4, 28, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. You see, you've been birthed by God himself. In verse 29, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Because... When Sarah finally gave birth to Isaac, she had this joy that, that here's this 90-year-old woman now holding God's promise. Hagar and Ishmael began to mock her and torment her. And it got so bad that she told Abraham, Abraham, cast this woman out. And Abraham was troubled by that because, I mean, he, that's his son, Ishmael. But God said, Abraham, do it do it and there's a I won't get into all of that we'll get into it later in the book of Galatians but the idea is those that are born in bondage will always despise those who are born free always and they will persecute you they will revile you they will call you names they will try to destroy your reputation they will accuse you of everything under the sun they will accuse you of all kinds of things that you've never done and, um, but that is the manifestation that you belong to God. Is that when they start accusing you of things that you did not do, and that hurts, just be glad that they're not accusing you of things that you actually did. Amen? So, um, anyway, Galatians chapter 2. Um, and I guess that's going to fit in with um, the lesson this morning. We have a group on Facebook. And it's the, the official Bethel Church Watchman Broadcast Group. And to join that group, uh, we, have, we have people who are administrators. We have a group of men that oversee that group. These are people who are online who consider themselves a part of this church. And so that's their meeting place. That's where they get together. And in order to join that group, you've got, we've got to, you've got to have your Facebook page open so we can see it and see who you are. And then there's a series of questions that we ask everybody. We're very protective of that group because we will have people, we will have wolves come in who will purposely try to get this guy that has caused trouble before, Chipper, he's tried to get in that group several times and he, he'll get in there to cause trouble. That's all he's done. And I'm going, this guy needs a job. If he had a job where he had to work 10 hours a day and come home so tired that he couldn't stand up, he wouldn't be doing this kind of foolishness. But I think he's on some kind of government pension. So he's got money and time and drugs and whatever. But anyway, I don't know that. But anyway, 
Um, but it's very, we try to protect the group because wolves will come in, not sparing the flock. Grievous wolves will come in. They will come in here, they have, and we've had to put them out. And I don't like it, but it's got to be done. Um, so Galatians chapter 2, verse 3, But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren. False brethren are not real brethren. They're not real Christians. They're not saved. They're not born again. Their name is not in the book of life. Because if they were, they would not be causing the trouble that they cause. They would not be doing that. There are differences of beliefs amongst genuine brethren. Um, I don't feel the need to try to go at everybody's church for what they believe and try to prove them all wrong so I can be right. I don't feel the need to do that. I don't need to. That's, if they're God's church and God's people, God, God will teach them. God will take care of it. But they were there to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. That's the purpose right there. Bring you into bondage. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. So I, when teaching you about infiltration, Jude chapter 1. For there are certain men crept in unawares. So they, they will sneak in. They will come in privily. Um, Acts chapter 20. Paul said, grievous wolves will enter in among you. They will come in, not sparing the flock. They'll come in pretending to be sheep. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And that's one of the reasons why they're there. They're there to draw people to themselves. Hey, everybody, follow me. Follow what I say. Follow what I do. And that's what they'll do. There are people... There, and this happens all the time, and I used to police it, and finally I just gave up. But I would, I would make some sort of Facebook post, like one of the videos we did, one of the sermons we did, everything we do gets posted. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Sermon Audio, we're trying to reach people. But there's always somebody who knows that my posts are going to get a lot of people looking at it, and so they will post comments in, in my post trying to draw people to their stuff. And they do it all the time. And I used to police it. If I would see it, I'd take it down. But I got to where I don't have time for this. I just don't have time to do it. So I got to the point to where, you know what? If you want to follow that clown, you go right on ahead. Follow. Follow Bozo. Follow him. You go, you go listen to him. If that's how you are anyway, go for it. Okay? So, but that's what they'll do. They, they were trying, they always try to draw disciples unto themselves. They sneak in. They creep in. They're wolves dressed like sheep. Um, Turn to uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. I told you last week I wanted to spend a little time with this. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. Um, and if you make notes, then note this. 2 Peter 2 and Jude are double witnesses of the teaching against false teachers. They're, they're, if you read both of them, you, you would think that one's copying from the other. But they're, they're saying practically the same thing. There's, one is saying it a little differently than the other. But they're saying essentially the same thing. They are the two witnesses that are trying to, to, to help you identify false teachers, false prophets. So 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily, 
very secretly, quietly, privately, never out in public. They'll never just come out and announce who they are and what they're trying to do. They always, always have to hide their agenda. Shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many, this is why you have mega churches, many shall follow their pernicious ways. Many shall. So if you're looking for a godly church to go to, if they're running 10,000 people, that's probably not it. There's something in, t in today's world, something always gets compromised in order to get that many people in. Something always has to be left out or taken out or we can't say this. Now, I, I heard some preachers talk one time and I'm going to pass this on. I can't tell you 100% is true, so I'm not going to name the, the ministry that, that it was involved in. But some, some pastors that I know, friends of mine, and I, I trust them. But I, again, it's you know third party stuff and I can't verify it. But they knew, a, they knew a man that was invited to be a big name preacher's youth minister. And when I say big name, I'm talking 50,000, 60,000 people in their church. That big. And of course, this guy, he's, you know, you can imagine, wow, they want me be their youth pastor wow what an opportunity okay and i know i know what he's thinking he's thinking number one i'm going to get paid well number two my name's going to be out there and everybody will know me and so i mean that was his that was his ego that was his pride getting to him but i'll say this about the man when he went interviewed for the position, he was told there's certain things you cannot say here. You cannot talk about hell. You cannot talk about sin. And gave him a whole list of things that he couldn't teach. But why? Because those are negative confessions. And if you say things like that, then basically... That's going to happen to those young people, and we don't want that. So the man could not teach against hell, even to say, you know, read verses out of the Bible. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that shall forget. He cannot say that, because in, this is what, the, this is what the, the big name preacher believed. He believed in positive and negative confessions, that if you say negative things, negative things happen. If you say positive things, then positive things happen. So he could only say positive things, which is witchcraft. I've studied witchcraft. I've got books on witchcraft. I've read them. I'm telling you, it's, it's called the law of attraction. It is witchcraft. Okay? The guy turned the job down, thankfully. Okay? So, but that kind of, now, if that story's true, I mean, I believe the idea of it. I believe it could very well be true because I know the name of the person who runs the ministry and it doesn't surprise me one bit. Okay. You can guess the name if you want, but I believe it. Okay. Damnable heresies. They will bring by, uh, and then what was I, where was I going with that? Many shall follow their pernicious ways by way, uh, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And that was exactly what that guy was dealing with. He, we have an obligation to speak the word, whether, whether we like or whether we like it or not, whether we think it's going to hurt somebody's feelings or not, whether we think it's going to cost us church members or not. Whether we think people are going to get mad at us or not, we have an obligation to speak what this book says. 
to the people that we know that they're doing what it is the, I'm going to have to preach about. If I know that you're doing something, I have to preach about it even though I know you're doing it. And I'll say this. I have to preach things that I know that I've been guilty of. Whether I feel like it or not, I have to say it. If it's wrong, it's wrong. But they will speak evil of the way of truth. That means they will hate this Bible. They will despise it. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. You are the product. You're the, you're the commodity. You're the one with the money in your pocket. And if they can get you into their church, they know there's a good chance they can get you to leave some of your money in that church. You are the merchandise that they're trading in. It's that simple. It's about money. The love of money is the root of all evil. That's the way the King James says it. Other Bibles say a root of all evil, but that's not what it is. It is the root of all evil. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, their damnation slumbereth not. Verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. By the way, look at verse 4. What sin was that? The angels that sinned in verse 4 that were cast into hell already, what sin was that? You, who said pride? Okay, who said something else? That's it. That. You see, there are, there are, there are devil's angels here on this earth now. They're not in hell yet. There is a group of angels that have already been cast down into prison for something they did. God charged them with the sin of folly. That's what he said in Job. He charged the angels with folly. The sin that they committed was they took them wives, all of which they chose, and bred the giants. That's what happened. Like I say, all of the other evil angels, they roam this earth and are free to go about their, their business. We, we see some of them in the Gospels where Jesus, you know, they were, they possessed certain people. Jesus cast them out. But there's a group of angels, this mentioned here in verse four, that they did, they weren't just in rebellion. They took human wives and for that God cast them down into prison so remember what I said about Jude so turn to Jude Jude is the companion to second Peter 2 so if you look in verse 6 the angels which kept not their first estate their first estate was heaven but left their own habitation he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. And then he equates it to this. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So here, Jude, like I say, Peter says it one way. Jude is giving you another piece of the information, but it's the same information. And Jude is telling you that what they did was they went after strange flesh and committed fornication. Those angels, that's what they did. They're, they're not just the, the devils that are roaming earth. This was a group of angels that God had to put in prison for what they did. He's going to release them, I believe, in Revelation 9. But anyway, back in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. Where is Sodom and Gomorrah? Nowhere. It doesn't exist. God destroyed it so completely 
that it is totally gone. No remnant of it whatsoever. It's gone. And God said that's supposed to be an example of those who live after. This is how God deals with sodomy. This is how God deals with it. And if we think that we're different and that God won't do that to us, we're wrong. They were the example. But delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth. And that, this is what I like about this. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. God knows how to do this. God knows how to save people, does he not? God's been doing it for, th for thousands of years, been saving people. God knows how to do it. From day to day, from their uh, vexed with righteous. For the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. And I want you to, I want you to write this down in your mind. And this is, this is going to be for me. The people who do wrong, the people who have done you wrong, God's not going to let them get away with it. He'll not let them get away with it. Just because he doesn't send fire and lightning bolts and arrows from heaven down to consume them immediately doesn't mean God's going to let them get away with it. When you think of the judgment of the lake of fire that burns forever and ever and ever, that is God's saying they're not getting away with it. Amen. Trust God always. Trust God always. That's for me. That's for me. But chiefly them, verse 10, that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness, despise government. That means they are rebellious. They do not like anyone being in any type of authority over them. Young people... God places people under authority. Even your parents are under authority and they have to obey rules. So young people, listen. Don't despise those who you must obey. Don't despise them. Don't Rebel against them. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. It got Saul killed. Because Saul rebelled. Others have died because they rebelled against the Lord. They broke God's rules. So these are the type of people that they would even be in a church. And despise church government. We had a young lady years ago. That worked in a position here where there was a board that governed her position. She marched into my office one day and railed against that board and named the names of the men that she despised on that board. And I sat there and listened to that and we got rid of her the next day. You can't do that. You can't do that. Do, where you work, could you go in and tell everything that you think about your stupid boss, how he's an idiot, doesn't know what he's doing, he has no right telling you what to do. Who in here can get away with that? Except my daughters, they could do that. They could tell that. Dad, you have no idea what you're doing. I'd let them, I'd let them say that. 
I'm a good daddy. But you just can't do that. And that happens a lot, especially in churches. People feel justified, they feel self-righteous, and they think they can rebel against God's areas of authority. And you just can't do it. God hates rebellion. Um, they're not afraid to speak evil of dignities, whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. Look at verse 12. These as natural brute beasts. Now remember, he's talking about false teachers and false prophets. And look at what he calls them. These as natural brute beasts. Now hold your place there in 2 Peter. And turn to Revelation 13. This Bible's right. Bible's right. Look at verse 11. Oh, it's, I'm not done. Let me show you this very quickly. Revelation 13, 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. You know who this beast is? It's not the Antichrist. It's the false prophet. And he's a beast. Now look back at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. These as natural brute beasts. And let me give the illustration Mike Hutzel gave me years ago, and it makes a lot of sense. I've used this illustration before. You get up in the middle of the night, you hear a noise, you hear someone breaking into your house. And so you grab that baseball bat you got by your door, and you go out of your room, and you go into a, a bedroom. And you're going to wait for the, whoever it is breaking into your house to walk down the hallway of your house, completely dark. And when he goes past you, then you're going to clobber him, bring him down to the ground or shoot him. Now, as he's going by, he steps on your toes. But you don't want him to know you're standing there. So do you have the ability to hold in your scream that he's stepping on your toes? Do you have that ability to hold that in? Yes. You can make the choice. I ain't screaming. I don't want him to know I'm here. What if it's your dog laying there and the guy walks by and steps on your dog's paw? Does your dog have the ability to hold in his yelp? That's the difference. Humans can make choices. Animals can't. These false prophets are brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. That means there is absolutely no changing their nature whatsoever. I want you to think of the devil. The devil is not a man that has the ability to choose what he can do. He's a dragon. He's a beast. He does what he does because that's what he was made to do. Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds have nests. He's describing the nature of beasts and animals. Foxes do not live up in trees. Birds do not dig holes in the ground and live in them. It is their nature to do what they do. And these false prophets, it looks to me like God has turned them over to such a reprobate mind. They're not getting saved. They're not changing. They're beasts made to be taken and destroyed. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. We thank you for it. Father, help us to understand the nature of how the enemy would love to infiltrate, to destroy, 
to bring down what it is that we're doing here. And Father, as long as we're doing your will and your ministry, then Father, we have nothing to fear because it's yours, not ours. It's yours to build, it's yours to tear down. It's yours. But Father, so long as it's yours, help us, dear God, to be a part of it. Thank you, God, for using us in your kingdom and your glory. Turn us not over to a reprobate mind, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.